you need to would have sent you some material okay so the first book you need to look at for fin 2601 for financial management is obviously okay the bit about the background um you guys are familiar with this i've sent some information through to you already okay so obviously this particular business is offering the private support classes and tutor services and um, if you do need any assistance um, there is a leave a question service as well so if you guys come across questions that you're struggling with send me an email pop me a message either via whatsapp or skype um, obviously weekly support classes are interactive so if you have any questions feel free to stop and ask um, you do have the custom support material i have sent that through to you guys so what i would suggest you do is print the material out weekly so you have a file of all the notes and you can write additional notes to them to help you with your learning and preparation for the exam. We will go, go through lots of questions um, and examples and we'll obviously cover past papers at a later stage. Okay, so the study guide you would have received from UNISA. Um, the UNISA study guides for finance, for INV, um, for, um, well, FSC, the, uh, the study guides are quite good. Um, for some of the other modules, they aren't as detailed. Um, so you do need to focus mainly on the textbook. The textbook is the best resource to refer to in terms of content and theory. Um, in the past, we've had some bad, let's say, experiences with UNIS in terms of their questioning. We've found lots of mistakes in um, assignments. We've found mistakes in past papers. So that has changed recently. So last semester and last year generally, uh, the first and second semester assignments and past papers were a lot better. Um, there weren't as many errors um, as you will see in some of the older past papers. So when we look at past papers from like 2013, 2014, 2015, um, there tends to be quite a lot of mistakes. Um, they either leave out information or um, they don't ask the questions correctly. So just bear that in mind when looking at older exams. The newer exams are a lot better, uh, but as I said, if you stick to the textbook, that's the main source of information um, and it gives you everything that you need for this course. If you are going to do more finance modules, um, then keep the textbook that you currently have. Um, UNISA is prescribing either first or second edition. Both yeah. can be used for this particular course. In third year, they're obviously refer referring more to the second edition because the, the examples in that textbook are, are updated and they're more relevant. So it doesn't matter which textbook you have, the theory in both are the same. The chapters are slightly different in terms of um, the numbering. So in chapter in, in edition one compared to edition two, you'll notice some of the chapters are, are numbered differently, but all the chapters are there, all the theory is there. Okay, you do need a financial calculator for this course. You can't do the calculations without one. Um, I recommend the Casio FC100V, but there is there are other options. Um, the HP is pretty good. Um, and the Sharp's also quite good. Um, if you can't get the cash here, then the Sharp is probably the next best option in terms of the, the ease of calculating certain amounts um, on the calculator. So you both do have calculators, yes? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, which makes do you have? I've got the, the HP 10B2. Yeah, okay, you've got the HP, perfect. All right, uh, Nicole also has the HP. I see she's actually, I think she might be having some technical problems. Okay. Um, Okay. If she calls, then she'll yeah, come back into the class. Yeah, it looks like she's she's left. I'm just going to type a message quick here. Um, please. Please. Okay, that's fine. All right. Um, I've sent her a message. Okay, so so Nina, you've got the HP. Great. Um, the HP is also good. Yeah. Um, we'll obviously use it a lot more in. FAC 1601, there was a, a small section at the end of the the, um, the actual module that covered some time value of money. We're obviously going to take time value of yeah. money a lot further now because we're looking at the decision making. So we're using information from the statements to obviously get some sort of measure to then make a decision. So the assignments, there's two we'll look at later on in the semester. Uh, we'll go through the workings and answers. The next bit that we need to look at here is the purpose and objectives for the module, FIN 2601. The main focus in this particular module is obviously giving you the tools, the basics that you'll then use later if you do do third year um, finance, which is the 3701 and 3702 modules. As I said, both of those modules at, at a third year level use the same textbook. 
when looking at financial management, we're focusing on the concepts and the principles. So you'll see you've cut or you will cover the first, I think it's around eight, seven or eight chapters in the actual textbook. Um, and we'll look at things like financial analysis. We'll look at things like time value of money and important risk and return relationship. So those are some of the concepts you'll see. The main takeaway from this module is obviously the skills, okay, the basic skills that you need. So time value of money is a skill. Understanding risk and return is a skill. Financial statement analysis is a skill. And then from there, we then build onto that um, in, in other areas. Okay. Right. If you can, um, try to do some pre-reading before. Um, as I said, the textbook is brilliant in terms of theory and content. The textbook's a lot better than um, the study guide in terms of uh, the depth. Okay, you get a lot more depth in terms of knowledge and information from the, te from the textbook than you would from the study guide. If you can, try make some notes. Um, you've got a set of slides to use as well um, that tries to focus on key concepts um, that come up quite often from a test and exam point of view. Um, this is a very practical subject, okay. so I am going to bring additional examples to class and we'll discuss some tonight even um, in, in, in a, a, a later slide when we look at the actual role that economics and accounting has um, toward financial management and making decisions. Okay, so when we're looking at study groups and questions, um, as I said, I'm open to any questions you have during the class. If you have something that you want to ask, uh, rather stop me and ask your question or even just type it to me in the um, the Skype chat, the instant messaging, that's also also fine. Okay, welcome back Nicole. Shame, is the internet a bit uh, problematic yeah. on your side? Yeah, I keep losing connection. Okay, um, maybe turn off your um, video, your webcam, so um, that might help with your connection in terms of receiving the the the, the, the content. Okay, right, but Great. Um, the classes are being recorded as well. Okay, so week by week we do have recorded classes. I will upload the recorded the recordings um, at the end of the week, and then they'll be available the following week. So if you do want to review or watch the videos again, um, you're welcome to. It'll be a, um, your Gmail email accounts will be assigned access. Um, you'll get a, um, an email either from me, uh, well, from me and from um, YouTube, and both will have a link for the actual um, video that you can watch at a later stage. Okay, so I know some of you might be um, maybe having some problems with connection and, and things like that. Um, all the videos are recorded and they are available later on. Okay. Alright, so let's have a look at study unit one. That's our focus for this week. Each week we'll be looking at a study unit and in a, um, I think it's around week four or five, uh, or five or six actually, we'll be looking at the assignment. But I will let you guys know in advance um, to try the questions in the assignment as practice um, to see how much of the actual workings you'll be able to do before we do it together in class. Okay, so when looking at the role and the environment of the, man the manager, okay, the financial manager, we need to define the functions. So when we look at functions, we're actually looking at their role. We're looking at what are they, res what are they required to do? What are their responsibilities? We also need to look at the legal forms of different businesses. So different businesses will, will have certain challenges. Okay, so smaller businesses have certain challenges. Larger businesses also have certain challenges. So when looking at the legal form of business, it could be a partnership, a CC, a um, company, a proprietor, all forms of, all the four forms of ownership will have certain things to consider in terms of finance. Okay, so some of them have access to more capital, some have access to less capital. Some are easier to manage and make decisions, some are more difficult. So the legal form of entity is actually important because we need to consider what the challenges and what are the advantages for, for having that type of business. We'll also look at the relationship between economics and accounting. So obviously we're in the month of um, February already um, in 2017 and um, time's really flying by. I mean it was, it was New Year's the other day and now we're already in the second month sure. of 2017. Um, the budget speech is something that takes place in February every year. So I do encourage you guys, if you are interested in um, listening or at least getting a, um, a summary of the actual budget speech, because the budget speech definitely affects decision making, um, both from a personal point of view in terms of taxes that we pay as individuals and also from a company point of view. 
Okay, so both the budget speech, okay, um, and anything that SARS comes out in terms of information is, is key. Okay, so the budget speech is obviously the tax and that the government can collect over the next 12 months. Right, we're going to look at the goal. The goal is a very, very important concept um, in terms of why businesses operate and what are they trying to achieve. And obviously with a goal in mind, there are going to be certain problems that we're going to have to deal with. So the one that we need to focus on quite a bit in this module is the agency problem. Okay, and what the agency problem is and how corporate governments can also help reduce that that issue, okay, that problem in the business. We'll look at different institutions and we'll talk a little bit about tax as well. This is the tax model, so there isn't a lot of tax that comes up. Um, you do need to have a basic understanding of tax and the importance when looking at making decisions relating to finance. Okay, so the first bit, I'd, I'd like you guys to consider, okay, the first question here in terms of what is finance. Okay, so maybe take a minute to think about it. What is finance? Okay, and then we'll, we'll see what feedback you guys have. Okay. Okay, Nino, what is the finance? Think we What is it? Uh, I've got it here as the science and art of managing money. Okay, nice. Okay, so um, when you say it's a science, um, is a science exact? Yes and no. Okay, um, science, well, when you say no, um, uh, what, what do you mean when you say no? When you say science isn't exact? Uh, well, don't they usually apply some theories that are exactly that, theories? They, they think it's going to happen and they, they're working with the future, so they don't yeah. really know, they're trying to plan for something that hasn't happened yet. All right, yeah, so that's, that's a good point in terms of maybe new discovery. Okay, so um, maybe the, the theory that they've discovered, we can say that's an exact science, uh, and that would be, yeah. would be correct, but, but definitely in terms of maybe new discovery, so scientists uncovering new elements, new, um, I don't know, stages of matter, and, and exploring space, and, and those types of things, and then I would definitely agree with you in terms of that being um, maybe not clearly defined, or not um, specific enough yet. But when, when we talk about science in general, it is quite exact. So when dealing with finance, you said art and science. So I like that because um, it can be very creative. So there can be room for creativity and new ideas. But at the same time, there are certain things that we need to know as being science, as being exact, we can't change. So when we measure the profitability of a business, or when we measure the a debt to equity ratio or the current ratio these are all ratios we'll look at later next week but if i look at a ratio do you agree i can't i can't manipulate or change the ratio because the ratio is exact that's an exact science vertical yeah. yes yes okay but um the way let's say the way we implement the plan okay could be an art as you said in terms of the art and science of managing money okay so definitely uh, finance is are resources limited or unlimited? Um, limited. Correct. So if resources are limited, what do companies need to do to manage them? Um, what do you mean, what do they need so, to do to yeah, manage so how, it? How do we manage limited resources? What do we, what do we have to do? Um, prioritize them and good. make it that they you take Sorry, yeah, carry on. Sorry, Anthony? Sorry, carry on. Um, I, I, I interrupted you. No, I just said that they must prioritize them and use them effectively. Okay, good. Okay, so when we look at limited resources, the projects and the investments we consider need to be thought out carefully before actually executing. Okay, so we don't want to waste resources because whose resources are we actually wasting? your own resources well if you're a sole proprietor yeah. then it would be your own but if it was for a company yeah, the, you were using the company's resources and the company's owned by who shareholders. good shareholders yeah the shareholders nice okay so when looking at finance um the textbook talks about two specific areas they talk about financial services and then they talk about more internal in terms of the managerial finance okay the function of the department so 
The first is obviously we need services to help us run the business effectively. Okay, so can you think of some services that a business would use as part of their day-to-day -day running? Services in terms of like their auditors or something like that? Okay, that's or, a financial service. Or... Correct. Okay, an auditor would be part of that. Okay, so they would assist with verifying that uh, books and records are accurate. All right, if we think more towards banking, what banking services could we use? Are really unlimited. They, they've got their online banking, they've got their payments, their, Good. their receipts. Good. Okay, so you can see the, the world of finance is quite broad and in terms of operations, businesses can't operate if they don't have those services. Right, let's say you were looking at yeah. importing and exporting products um, from South Africa um, or importing to South Africa or either exporting, depending. So if we're looking at that, we're then going to have to consider um, maybe foreign exchange, okay? And we're going to have to then approach the bank to help us with that particular transaction. Okay, so as you said, banking is broad. Okay. There's a lot of different products and services we can consider um, that'll help us with running the business effectively. And internally, the duty then of the financial manager is to make sure that the financial affairs are being met in terms of the planning, the credit, the budgeting, the cash flow, the strategy, and there are other things that they could consider as well. Okay, so their, their responsibility yep. is to manage that function. Okay, because a lot of businesses view the finance department as being the heart of the business. Okay, and the heart we know um, pumps blood to the rest of the body. Okay, so if you think about finance, obviously we have different departments running um, different areas. So we have IT, we have legal, we have procurement, we have sales, we have so many different departments as part of that bigger organization. So when looking at finance, okay. do all these departments need resources? Yes. Definitely. And those resources are going to be purchased using capital, using finance. And that forms part of the business's makeup in terms of the business being the body, okay, or, or the organs, again, okay, and the heart keeping the body alive. Okay, so when looking at what is finance, finance is important because you might not be specifically involved in that department, but you will have an impact or your decisions in your department will affect that department. All right, so we need to try yeah. to broaden our scope in terms of finance isn't just the finance department's problem. Finance is everyone's consideration. Everyone needs to consider um, ways and means to, uh, to well, not to limit, to maximize the limited resources. Okay, so what we have in the organization, we need to try and make use of it as best we can. Okay, and then at a later stage, we'll look at ratios. Ratios actually help us to do that. Ratios help us to analyze how effective are we um, in terms of maybe profitability or how productive are we? Okay, or are we collecting capital in terms of maybe are we collecting receipts uh, in terms of cash, or are we making payments too too late or too soon, depending on the situation? Okay, all right. So that's that's the basic um, introduction in terms of finance. Okay, what is it? Now we need to look at the different types of businesses. So we mentioned four earlier: sole proprietors, partnerships, CCs, and companies. Companies are obviously broken up into two, and the focus for us in most questions will be on that, on companies, okay, public and private. Right, so what is a private company? Uh, it's a company owned by someone, isn't it? Yes, correct. So if it's private, um, what what benefit do private businesses have compared to, let's say, a public uh, they, business? Um, they Mm, they don't have to be audited or, or no, they do have to be. No, they don't. You're right. Private companies don't have yeah. to be audited by law. Public companies do. Um, private companies can yeah. choose to be audited um, if they want to in terms of maybe internal auditors. An internal audit could be conducted. But private companies aren't required by law to have their financial statements audited because think about a private company as being very limited in terms of ownership okay so you could literally have two three four people owning a company a private company and with those three four five yeah. people 
all five are going to be owning a part of that business. So for them, the risk lies with those individuals. The risk doesn't lie with, let's say, you and I, because we would be external parties. So with public companies, yeah. the big difference with a public company compared to a private company is obviously legislation. Okay, public companies yeah. are responsible to the public, society as a whole. So public companies have to then audit their statements. Um, most public companies are listed on some form of exchange. Okay, we'll, we'll look at that later when we look at the uh, financial markets. But that's key in terms of information. Okay, so you, you guys have learned accounting before and you know that statements have to be prepared in certain, uh, according to certain rules. But now, mm. when we're a public or private company, you may or may not have um, to check and to audit and to prove that your statements are 100% correct. And 100% what you say um, is or 100% in terms of validity. Okay, so those statements are valid. Those statements are truthful and honest, and users can then make um, uh, make use of the statements to make decisions. Right, so when looking at these different forms of businesses, um, if you had to start a business today, you know, uh, which one would you choose? Uh, probably a company or a partnership. A company or a partnership. Okay, so let's choose between company and partnership. Which one would you go with? Um, maybe partnership for now because it's it's easier to get started, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Good. Good point. Okay. So partnerships are easier to start than companies. Okay. Um. There's obviously less cost involved as well in terms of starting that actual entity. Okay. So that's a good point. So when looking at all these different forms of businesses, they all have their pros and their cons. Is a partnership the best form of ownership? Not really. No. Because why not? aren't you're you not considered a separate legal entity, aren't you? So Correct. if the company gets into trouble, then you attach to it. Correct. Good. Okay, so there's liability in terms of uh, unlimited liability. So if you're owing a lot of creditors um, cash for purchasing goods and services, you're going to have to then pay out of your own pocket to meet those obligations if the business can't meet the yeah. obligations. Okay, good. All right, so on the next page... I've taken a, a screenshot of a table that the textbook actually provides you with that shows some of the strengths and weaknesses for these different forms of ownership. So from an exam point of view, um, I haven't seen you need to ask any long questions about different forms of ownership, but I've always seen them ask short questions relating to strengths and weaknesses or characteristics. So it's normally multiple choice. Um, the exams that you'll be writing are half written and half multiple choice. So when looking at yeah. this in terms of theory, this would come up as a theory question in the short question. So they might ask you about, um, or they might give you a statement and then ask you which of the four fo forms of ownership does that statement refer to. And you'll have to then know what the pros and cons are to each. Yeah. Okay, so just look at this. The, the point that I want to make here is access to finance. Okay, because that's always an important concept that gets built on more and more going forward. We're looking at access to finance or availability of finance. Right, so if I'm looking at a sole proprietor, how much access to finance do you think they have? It's very limited. Correct. Okay, there's a limited amount of finance that they can access in terms of capital. Generally, Small businesses would either have to use loans or private capital to start the business. Same thing with the partnership, but now yeah. you've got two or more individuals that can help with financing the business. CECs and companies yeah. benefit for them in terms of finance? It is easier for them to get finance because they can sell shares and all that sort of stuff. Correct, good. Okay, so CECs and companies have a much bigger scope of, of different types of finance that they can access. Right, as an individual or as a partner in a business, you have less scope in terms of where you can seek capital if you do need it. Mm -hmm. Right, then we've got a note over here about the managerial function. Okay, this is looking at the structure of the organization. Okay, we touched on this earlier. So, um, Nina, what department are you in um, at your respective um, company? 
that I'm a jack of all trades. I'm involved with everything. Okay, great. So we could probably put you here then, right? CEO almost. <laughs> My dad might not like to hear that, but yeah. <laughs> all right, but 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 you're right in terms of saying that. Okay, so you're a jack of all trades, meaning um, you you're helping and assisting all the departments. Yes. Okay, yeah. so as as one of the important decision makers, then okay for your department. If I'm looking at the organization of the actual finance function, okay, um, mm. maybe just give me some of the departments that you have at your company that you deal well, with on a day to day basis. I deal with the finances on a daily basis with the creditors and debtors and, and procurement or materials and all that. So I am pretty hands on with the finances. Yeah. Um, Sales as well, because I deal with the customers as well. Production. Anything else you can think of that you deal with um, regularly? Um, I'm involved with the production on a daily basis as well. Production, um, even operations as well. Right? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so we're looking at this. Are you always aware of everything that happens in all the departments? Um, yes, and I should know what's cutting and everything, but there are times where assistant beyond your region don't actually know what's going on. Okay, and, and why is that? Just because of the mass of information that there is, sometimes you just miss something and only pick it up later once it's been processed or put through okay, a good. different channel. Alright, so as you said, massive amounts of information. One person can only do so much. So when we look at how the finance function is organized, okay, um, larger companies or corporations tend to have a finance person in each department or, or someone that can assist with the finance in that department. So um, you might have, let's say, procurement as being an important department that's quite big. So there might be one individual there that's assisting with procurement, but their role is a financial function role in terms of uh, maybe doing the budgets and doing the reports and, and, and all the matters specifically related to procurement that's going to affect the business's entire fi finance function. Okay, so obviously the CEO needs to get the information from the CFO. Okay, so the chief financial officer should be the best person that the CEO is going to go to to get information about finance about all the departments because all of the departments should be moving information to that one individual. Okay, so when we look at organization of the finance function, we're focusing on a segregation of duties, okay, because if we keep duties separate, there's going to be less um, less of a problem. Let's 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 say it's going to be less fraud that could possibly occur in the business. All right. So I, I hope that you haven't yeah. had any instances of fraud yet at your business, or have you? No. Okay, you have. No. no. Well, maybe my dad's maybe my dad's stealing from us, but <laughs> I doubt he is. All right. Okay, but yeah. So in terms of the roles and responsibilities, obviously the bigger and bigger the company gets, um, the more difficult it is to manage all the departments. And that's why separating duties are key because we need to have some sort of reporting line so that we know who to go to when we need certain reports or information. Okay. And when we're looking specifically yeah. at finance, um, the roles that are quite important here would be financial manager, obviously. Okay. So someone who manages the actual function. Um, accountants do what? They, they gather the information and prepare the the information for the managers to look at, isn't it? Hundred percent. Yeah, accountants are the um, information providers. They're drawing up the reports, they're drawing up the statements, and they're presenting that obviously mm. to the manager. Okay, so normally financial managers have an accounting background because they need to know how to read and interpret that information. Okay, good. And you've yeah. also got this foreign exchange manager. There could be other roles as well. Okay, it could be a creditors department, so a credit manager. There could be a debtors department, so someone looks looking after the debtors. It all depends on how big the organization yep. is. Right, then I've got two yep. areas here. The first being the relationship to economics, and the second being the relationship to accounting. 
Okay, so let's look at the first one, economics. What is economics? It's the study of the economic environments, isn't it? Okay, and what does the economy make up of? Uh, so give me some examples. It's very broad, but what are some of the key factors when it comes to economics? Uh, isn't it the, there's the market environment? Good. Uh, which was the other one? Then there was the one where the government fits in. Um, okay, so maybe public sector? Yes, public sector, that was the other one. And then there was a third one on the inside. I can't remember which that one was. Okay, so do you agree economics affects everyone, yes? Yeah. Okay, it doesn't matter how big or small the business is. The business will be affected by certain, um, let's say, news items perhaps, or certain measures in terms of maybe GDP. Okay, so if the country is yeah. doing really well, that's going to be positive for the economy as a whole and positive for the company. Because remember, as a financial manager, we're focusing on the company. We're trying to maximize the company's value. Okay, And in order to do that, we need to look at economics because there might be a recession, there might be a boom, and depending on what sort of economic situation the country is in, it'll either be more easy or more difficult to do business. Same thing with unemployment. Yeah. You might need staff. It might be difficult to employ individuals if they don't have the right skills. So that's also yeah. something to consider in terms of economics. And then interest rates. If the rates fluctuate, that's going to make borrowing more expensive or cheaper, depending on the situation. Okay, so when we look at economics, economics yeah. is very practical because it's focusing on everything. Okay, and it's looking at how news, in terms of the, um, the reports that we hear on a day-to-day -day basis, how that affects our decision making. So let's say if there's a, um, okay, I think let me rather um, put up the example and then we'll discuss that one. Okay, it might be better in terms of having context. Okay, so before we look at the example, let's look at this one with the accounting. So what is accounting, you know? You mentioned what an accountant does. So what is the accounting discipline actually focusing on? The, the gathering of the financial information. Okay, so the, the would you monitoring agree? Process. Sorry, just say that again? The last bit? The monitoring of the finance. Monitoring of the finance. Anthony, can you hear me? So the data, is going to comprise of what? What data do the accountants use? Um, the financial data. Okay. Um, so where the do they get the where do they get the transactions? Um, from what's the source documents, isn't it? Good. Okay, source documents. So invoices, receipts, toll slips, um, purchase requisitions, etc. Okay, those are all different source documents that would that would uh, indicate economic activity and that would provide data that the accountants could then use to generate reports. Right, so when looking at reports, their function would be to generate the statements and those statements are either very specific or, or, or summarized depending on who they're reporting to. So obviously we get two types of accounting. Do you know what the two types are? Uh, there's... Isn't it managerial accounting and no? That's right. Management accounting is the one and the other. Uh, uh, operational accounting, isn't it? Uh, no, financial accounting. So you get financial accounting and, mani and management accounting. So those are the two areas where accounting has been separated because management accounting is very detailed. Okay, so um, if you are going to be doing MAC uh, modules with UNISA, uh, the MAC modules cover the management accounting and the level of detail there is is greater than the financial accounting because managers need to know more detail to make decisions. When look at financial accounting, we're looking more at the reporting at a summary level for people like investors or government, okay, where they're looking more external in terms of what they need is just the headline earnings per share perhaps or the sales or the total revenue or the amount of tax that needs to be paid. That's all they're interested in from a high level point of view. So 
financial accounting is more summarized and then management accounting is a lot more detailed because it's their role. Okay, remember the finance function needs to report for both internal users and external users. So by reporting for both, we'll have to have detail and we'll have to have summary. And that obviously creates a relationship between the finance function okay, and its dependence on accounting. Okay, because the finance function is not going to know how the business is operating if it doesn't have accounting standards or rules that can generate the statements. Okay, so two relationships to consider when dealing in the finance department. The first being economics and the second being accounting, the rules. And rules can change. IFRS obviously gets reviewed, okay? The basics won't change, but certain... Um, standards can be improved okay so obviously with changes in technology right and with different products and services coming uh, to market there might be different accounting standards that need to be written okay to provide for those differences so i mean just to keep it simple um, if we think a few a few years back we never had as many financial products as we did today so before the internet um, we couldn't do online banking but in today's world, we can. So in terms of relationship to accounting, obviously things need to change slightly because the landscape has changed. Okay. Right, and the focus is always on decision making. Right, so I'm going to pause here yeah. for now and I'm going to put up some examples to discuss this whole idea of a relationship to economics and the relationship to accounting. Okay, so the first example that I want to put up for, for you um, is this one. Okay, so... Okay, the credit score. All right, so I just want to highlight this first before we discuss the article. Okay, um, I just Googled SA credit rating, okay, from Google. And if you look at the SA credit rating, these are the different agencies around the world. You've got Moody's, Fitch, S&P, and Mood, um, well, okay, they've written Moody's twice here in terms of outlook, right? So if we just look at the first three, okay, Moody's, Fitch, and S&P. If you look at the rating, okay, what is a credit rating? You pr you've probably covered this in economics. Yeah, it's your, not value, but your, your strength. In, in terms of? Your, your finances. Whether yes. Okay, your, you agree? Stable. It's, it's almost like a credit rating or a credit score that an individual would have, right? Yeah. Okay, so as an individual, we have a credit score. So the bank will only give you a certain amount as a loan based on your credit report, do you agree? Yeah, yeah. All right, so the same thing happens for a country. Each country will have its own credit rating. And if you look at our current credit rating, Moody's has us at B, um, BAA2, okay? Fitch has us at triple B minus, and S&P has us at triple B minus. And those are the outlooks, yeah. negative, stable, and negative. So looking at that, if this had to change, if the ratings had to change, what will happen to our lending okay, in, and, and our, our debt markets in South Africa? Would debt become more expensive or cheaper? Um, depends which way it goes. If it goes worse, the lending will become more expensive. Good. And if it gets better, lending will become more affordable. Nice. So from a financial management point of view, as a manager, should the manager be mindful of what's happening politically and economically in the country? And, and should they be looking at something like this, the credit rating? Definitely. Good. Okay, because do you agree it's going to affect everyone, irrespective of whether we're an individual or company or business or um, government institution, it's still going to affect us in terms of our financing. It's going to make lending more easy or difficult, as you said, depending on which way the rating goes. All right, yeah. so nice. So that's a good start in terms of the credit rating. If you look at this article here, okay, um, this came out today. They're talking about axing Gordon, okay, will result in immediate downgrade. This is the article, and they're looking at this whole dispute that's going on in, in, in the political um, landscape um, regarding the current finance minister. All right, so we know that our current finance minister is going to be giving a budget speech toward the end of Feb, yes? Yes, right. yes. And, and why, does the, why does the finance minister give that speech? 
Because he's the boss of it all. He knows what's going on. Okay. He calls the shots. Okay. And and in terms of department, the finance minister manages treasury, right? Yeah. Okay. So what is treasury for the government? Um, they, they bank basically, isn't it? Um, yes, it's, it's basically like the, um, let me go back to this picture. It's this, that's, that's basically what treasury is for the business. Treasury for the business is where they seek funding for different areas. So if government wanted to build more yeah. schools, where do they go? They go to treasury because treasury and the finance minister, they're obviously responsible for the allocation of funds. So they determine how much money each department gets. How much does healthcare get? How much does education get? How much does um, police and, and safety get? So all of that gets distributed from that department. So is the finance yeah. minister's role very important? I'd say so. Definitely. So what happens if the finance minister is axed? Is that a good thing or bad thing? It's a bad thing because it puts instability into the system, doesn't it? Correct. Good. See, that's important. Okay, because now at a later stage, we'll be looking at risk. We'll be discussing risk. Okay, so when looking at risk, risk affects finance, not because it's going to directly affect, let's say, the, the rands and cents, but it could indirectly affect the rands and cents. Because if something like this happens, yeah. remember, this is politics. Okay, politics and business shouldn't mix. But it does influence, okay, so politics will influence business. If something like this had to happen, so this is the, um, let's say, speculation or the news reports that are being um, presented um, in the public sector, in the public eye. Okay, so obviously I'm talking about this in terms of should this happen. If the finance minister had to be axed, there would be an immediate downgrade. Okay, we spoke about the credit rating. What is that going to do to the country's lending? Sorry, Anthony, you broke up there. Oh, I'm, I'm saying, what is this going to do to the, con the country's lending? Uh, if Gordon gets axed, yes. it will make it expensive to borrow. Good. Okay, so that's going to create a complete... Um, it's, it's going to change the landscape when it comes to financing debts. Yeah. All right, and companies need debt and equity to operate. They need both. All right, is that okay? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. All right, so let's discuss the agency problem. Okay, when looking at the agency problem, we need to understand the different functions in a particular organization. Okay, so again, this is a snapshot from your textbook looking at the way companies are structured. Right, so who actually owns okay. the company? Um, the owners. And who? The, the shareholders. Yes, okay, good. So those are the owners or the shareholders for that particular organization. Okay, and what are shareholders interested in? Profits. Correct. Then you've got the board of directors. Okay, which is which are elected by the owners, and then you've got someone who calls the, the the shots in terms of the final decisions that need to be made. Okay, managers then report to the CEO. So you could have lots and lots of okay. different roles in the actual organization. Obviously, the one that we're focusing on mainly is the finance department. So the CFO would be important, and obviously the CFO would have several managers and accountants that would assist them with generating the financial information. So if we look at all of those individuals down at the bottom here, so from that line downwards, okay, what yeah. are they focused on? Um, what do they want? Sorry, Anthony? Yeah, what do they want? They want to operate as efficiently and profitably as they can. Really? So, in their specific... So for those individuals, for all of them, profit is the key for them. Uh, not entirely. It should be, but it's not. Why not? 
because of uh, who was it? I mean, the, the pension fund manager, he doesn't really have profits on his mind, doesn't he? Okay, so if we just look at the one person, yeah, we could look at any of these individuals, pension fund manager, okay? Is the pension fund manager going to be focusing on the, on the profit for the business or is the pension fund manager more focused on the employee's benefits? Yeah, he, that's his focus, that's his job. Okay, that's his job. So do you agree as the pension fund manager, your focus is to try to get the most benefits for your employees? Yeah. So now, if that was the key and that was the focus in terms of their role, what's stopping the pension fund manager from taking from the profit and giving more benefits to the employees? Nothing really. If he gets caught doing it, he might get into a bit of trouble. But there's checks and balances in place that stop him from doing that, isn't it? Yes, there is. Okay, good. So, yeah, we're getting to corporate governance and we're getting to rules and, and, and policy and code of conduct and, and those types of things. So, you're right. There's nothing really stopping the, the pension fund manager from doing certain things that would benefit the employees in general, but disadvantage the shareholders. Right. The same thing with the CEO. What's stopping the CEO from paying himself a big bonus? Nothing. Yeah, there's nothing really. Other than, All right, it, it needs to be yeah. communicated and reported to the shareholders, but there's nothing stopping the CEO from awarding him or herself a big bonus. So when looking at yeah. above the line and below the line, okay, do you agree there's a conflict of interest? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. So the conflict of interest is between two main groups of individuals, the, the stakeholders and the shareholders. Okay, stakeholders yeah. are grouped into other categories. We can talk about employees, we can talk about suppliers, we can talk about customers, we can talk about government. Right, so what does government want? Mm, employment Good. and taxes. Employment and taxes. So let's just talk about employment. Would you agree government would want all businesses in the country to employ more staff? Yes. But... If we employ more staff in the business, are we going to be able to still operate and make a profit? Uh, you could, but it's more than likely not. You could, you're right. But if we're employing people that, let's say, aren't going to be working as hard as the next person in the company, it's going to create more of a problem for the company in terms of operating rather than um, yeah. succeeding or, or making a profit. So that's, that's a good point. So when looking at stakeholders, even with an employee, does an employee want to work longer hours? Um, yeah, if they're getting paid overtime. Okay, so again, see that's the, the, the conflict of interest. So employees, would employees, um, or let's say employees want more benefits, right? So would employees want more leave? Yes. Okay, would shareholders want to give employees more leave? No. No. Okay, so do you see how there's a conflict of interest between the two parties? Yeah. Okay, and that's what the agency problem is actually focusing on. Okay, it's a mismatch between your, your um, priorities or your focus. Okay, so when looking at tests and exams, they normally try to paint a picture. They normally describe a scenario and then they ask you to, to identify what problem or which of the four is the agency problem. And that's what they tend to do. So they try to paint a picture. So do you agree? In terms of business, does the business have an obligation um, to clean up the environment, to not pollute? Yes. Why do they have an obligation? Because if they don't maintain that environment, it sets himself up to not be able to operate in that environment in the future. Okay, possibly. But let's think about, um, okay, not so long ago, they were talking about um, fracking in the Karoo. They were looking for gas deposits in the Karoo um, that would literally change um, the industry completely in terms of energy in, in South Africa. But if they had to go and um, and... And investigate and, and try find gas in the crew it was going to harm the natural environment so do you agree yeah 
Are shareholders going to be opposed to fracking in the crew? <laughs> yeah, it depends which shareholder you talk to. Like some of them might just out of an ethical standpoint and others might say, no, go for it because we're only worried about the money. Yes, okay, so that, that's the big difference. So uh, obviously it, it does depend on which shareholder you're talking to, definitely. But if we're just looking at the theory, okay, theory says that shareholders are only focused on profit. And theory says that stakeholders are focused are focused on other areas. So, a stakeholder would be um, a a human rights, um, let's say, committee or a um, uh, what do you call those? Those nature conservationists, right? Those people that okay. that look after the environment. So they would be opposed yeah. to destroying the environment in the name of profit. But shareholders. Yeah. In terms of theory, we're not we're not considering if they're ethical or unethical shareholders. We're just saying shareholders, in terms of their role, the role that they play in the bigger picture is to focus on profit, because companies only yeah. succeed if they are generating cash or finance to continue operating. Okay, so obviously cash flow is more important yeah. than profit, right? That was something we've looked at in accounts before. Um, in this module. Not too much of the account will come up. A bit of the ratios, but you, you're not going to be drawing up accounts. You're just going to be calculating certain values and amounts. So when looking at the goal of the firm, what should the goal of the firm be, irrespective of what group we belong to, stakeholder or shareholder? Um, to maximize the share price. Okay, why do you say the share price and not maximize profit? That's a good answer. Uh, because if they're maximizing their share price, then they're going to be operating effectively and making it that people want to buy into the business, isn't it? Yes, okay, and, and the share price is actually a better measure of this, of value and wealth than just profit. Yeah. Okay, good. So, because a company could be showing a profit, but the actual value isn't worth much because that, that profit is false. Correct, yes. Okay, good. So, for example, as you said, profitable companies can go bankrupt, unprofitable companies can continue to operate. It all depends on how they're managing their business and how they're managing their finance. Before the break, we spoke about the agency problem. If you can give the agency problem, uh, or if you, if you can explain the agency in pro problem in one sentence, what would you say it is? Um, the mismatch of priorities and focus of the companies and the or the shareholders and the stakeholders. Perfect. Okay, so there's definitely a mismatch between shareholders and stakeholders, and the reason for that mismatch. Um, uh, conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest. Okay, so shareholders wanting profits, stakeholders wanting more benefits. Yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, so when looking at the next section, you'll see in the first chapter, they talk about financial institutions and they talk about the different markets. So the first thing that okay. we, need to, we need to look at is this whole concept of an intermediary. Okay, when we look at the word intermediary, what does that refer to? Uh, like a, a go-between or a middleman, isn't it? Yes, okay, so when you say middleman, are you referring to like a broker perhaps or an advisor? Yes, yeah, like, like a broker would... Yes, like a broker. You would to a broker about buying shares for you. Correct, okay, so if I'm looking at the intermediary, do I only buy shares from a broker or can I buy the products? Uh, you can buy the products, can't you? Yes, you can. Okay, so when looking at the institution, do you agree the institution is going to be offering deposits? And, and how does a deposit help a business? Uh, it increases their, their capital, doesn't it? And why else would you want to deposit your cash into a bank rather than not keep it at... at because think about it, banks also um, charge high fees. Yeah, uh, because of the, the interest that you'd receive from it, isn't it? Okay, good. So one incentive could be the interest that we receive from the actual deposits that we make with the institution. Or another option, or reason rather, uh, would be the safety. Um, is it safe to keep lots of cash at the business premise? 
No. No, it wouldn't be a good idea to do that. So that's why we've got the financial institutions because they offer those services. Right, so when looking at intermediaries, all we're looking at here is the service that they can provide. And the service could be deposits, okay, in terms of taking deposits, keeping it um, safe, providing us with interest in terms of savings, maybe acquiring loans, or even investing in areas where we couldn't necessarily have access to. Okay, so sometimes businesses don't have access to certain markets, but banks have access to those markets. So you can utilize yeah. that intermediary as a way to access those products. Okay. Okay. Financial markets, we get two types. Think about, think about a market as a meeting place for buyers and sellers. Okay, that's all it uh-huh. is. So when you, go to the, when you go to the local grocer okay, and you're buying your fruit and vegetables, okay, um, that's a meeting place for buyers and sellers. Okay, we're not going to travel all the way out to the farm to get fresh fruit and vegetables. We're going to go to our local store because that's the supermarket where we access those goods. So when looking at financial products, the meeting place for buyers and sellers would be the JSC as an example, okay? The New York yeah. Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, right? The banks even, okay? So the market is a meeting place where we can access these products and services that help us run our business more effectively. Right, because if you think about it, a business needs to seek capital. They, they, they can't expand if they don't have capital. So in order to yeah. expand, we need to raise capital. So if I'm looking at a bank, the bank can only give me a loan, right? Yes. Generally. Okay. But if I want yeah. to issue shares, I'm going to have to do that through the JSE. Right, so banks would assist yeah. with that transaction. And that's why we have two types of markets here. You get a primary market and you get a secondary market. Primary is when we first issue new securities on the exchange. All right. This is very similar to your accounting that we looked at in FAC 1601, where you actually did the accounting of um, equity in terms of shares and um, share issue expenses and and the effects on bank and, and, and retained earnings and all that. We looked at yes, the yes. IPOs when companies first list on ex- on exchange. Yeah. So when companies but first list on an exchange, yeah. that's the IPO. Mm. IPO stands for In- initial product offering. A uh, public public yeah, offering. Initial public yeah. offering, and that's when they first list on an exchange. So companies want to list on an exchange because that generates capital. And we said earlier, the biggest advantage for a business is, or for a company rather, is... To generate capital. Yeah, access to capital. So the more access to capital you have, um, the more likely you are to grow and and succeed as as an entity. Okay, remember, growth is dependent on the amount of capital you have. Yep. All right, then we've got secondary markets. This is where investors can purchase securities or assets from other investors rather than from issuing companies themselves. Right, so secondary would be this. Okay, so when the company first lists on an exchange, that's the IPO. But now those those shares would be trading on the exchange. And that forms part of the secondary market because now everyone can have access to those products. So if you wanted to buy shares yeah. in a particular company, you'd be able to do so, but you're not going to be buying those from the companies themselves. You're going to be buying those shares from other shareholders. So that's the difference between primary and secondary. Yeah. Okay. So okay. with primary and secondary, there are a few terms here that we need to look at. Obviously, we spoke about IPO being the initial public offering when we first list. Then you get two types of markets. You get the money market and you get the capital market. Money market short term, capital market is long term. Okay, money market gets talked about a lot. Um, you probably have some sort of money market type account where you get interest, okay? And that interest is normally a bit better than what the bank would obviously give you because the money market is looking at businesses, okay? Dealing with certain products in terms of loans between those institutions. Okay, so money market generally offers higher interest rates. Okay. All right, capital, we're looking at long-term. So what is a long-term loan called? Um, 
a it's completely slipped my mind and i'm gonna kick myself it is a non-current okay non-current is good so non-current liabilities or long-term liability is great but when we talk about finance we'll be talking about bonds oh okay oh that's what you meant okay but that's fine your your answer was correct from the accounting point of view um, from the finance point of view, uh, when looking at the capital market, we're looking at bonds. We're looking at debt. Okay, the debt market. Okay. Right, so it's actually quite funny to think about debt as actually being a product. Yeah. Okay, but it actually is. And debt is a very, very big product in the market because it's viewed as being, inverted commas, safer than equity. Okay, but not really because if you think about it, you're actually buying a liability. Yeah. But remember, if you buy a liability, it becomes an asset. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. All right. So if you, yep. so for example, if you give someone a loan, is that a liability? Uh, for them, yes. For them, yes. But, but for not you? for you. No. No. Correct. Okay. So that's the difference between money market and capital market. One's long term, one short term. If it's the capital market, it's long term, okay? And the, the products that we'll look at there are generally bonds. Then you've got a securities okay. exchange. A securities exchange is just a regulated marketplace. Right, so let's think about this. We spoke about food and vegetables. Okay, you're not going to go and buy fruit and vegetables from a um, unknown, let's say, farmer, okay? It, and the reason for that is there's no regulation. So you don't know where they got those fruit and vegetables from. Okay, you don't yeah. know if they were um, organic or not, let's say. All right, so okay. when looking at a securities exchange, so all of these exchanges, we saw JSE earlier. Here are two others, London Stock Exchange and New York Stock Exchange. They're all regulated. And if something is regulated, is that better or worse than if it wasn't? Generally better. Generally better. Right. Why? Because there's a set set of rules and regulations that you have to follow and other people have to follow as well. So you know that you're not going to be doing one thing Correct. and another person is going to jump the line and get ahead of you and get a better price for some reason. Correct. Nice. Okay. So that's a very, very good point in terms of pricing, okay, in terms of um, not um, not having unfair pricing. Because if we did buy let's say our fruit and, and vegetables from an unknown person, um, they, could either charge us, they could either charge us a lot more or a lot less depending on the situation. But at least yeah. if we purchased it from a regulated um, um, marketplace, so a retailer, a large retailer, we know what sort of quality we'll get and we'll know that the price is correct and we're not being uh, ripped off by the actual provider. Yeah. Okay, so when you go and buy... Um, equity or um, shares in terms of um, any of the exchanges, right? There, the prices are quoted fairly. Okay, they're fairly priced. They're not making up prices and then selling you these products. Yeah. Okay. Then you've got brokers and dealers. Brokers are obviously more focused on the sales process, so they're they're trying to sell. Brokers are the people that go out and find um, sales. Right. They're they're focused on closing the deal. Dealers are the yep. ones that generally try to make the market. So they're trying to create more demand. Okay, so when you look at about it, when you think about a dealer, think about the dealer as being more important than the broker because the dealer actually creates a market. Okay, they're dealing in a specific product or service. So there might be a new product that comes out, and if we're if we're the dealer, we're looking at trying to generate more um, interest and more traction okay in the market for that particular product brokers are there to yeah. to almost um let's say facilitate in terms of closing the transaction okay yeah then you get over the counter over the counter is the opposite to securities exchange okay so okay. we spoke about buying fruit and vegetables okay if i buy from a reputable retailer that would be the securities exchange, okay? Because I'm buying regulated inverted commas stock. But if I had to buy fruit and vegetables from, I don't know, a local farmer, let's say in the community, okay? That would be viewed as over the counter. Right, so over the counter is between parties and it's unregulated. 
<laughs> Sorry, Anthony. Okay. My dog's going ballistic at the door, yeah. <laughs> Alright, okay, don't stress, it's fine. Um, so, did you did you hear what I said in terms of the securities and the over-the-counter? Uh, no, I lost you over there. You broke up a little bit and then the dogs went bad. Oh, alright, okay. So, let's quickly just recap. Securities exchange is a regulated exchange, so that's buying from a reputable um, provider. Yeah. And then over the counter is when you have an unregulated market. That's like between parties, between individuals. There's no regulation. Okay. Okay. Then you've got two prices. You've got a bid price and you've got an ask price. The one is the price offered to purchase and the one is the price offered for sale. All right. Okay, and then the last bit here, before we look at the examples, okay, um, I've got two more things to show you, and then that's the, the end of um, this particular week in terms of the first chapter. The first chapter is quite short because it's mainly introduction, setting the picture, giving some theory. Uh, there aren't any calculations in the first um, chapter. The calculations come up next week. Okay, so next week we'll be looking at the ratios and doing one or two calcs there. Last bit over Perfect. here is tax. What is taxes? It's what the government wants when you do a transaction. Okay, so tax arises on a lot of different um, types of transactions. So you're right. If if you're buying something, there'll be VAT. If you're earning yeah. something, there'll be pays you earn, okay, or income tax. So if you're importing and exporting, then there'll obviously be import and export duties and, and, and other taxes that you'd have to pay in that scenario. So with business yeah. taxes, we're focusing on the form of entity. So, are sole proprietors okay. taxed? Uh, in their personal, personal capacity, yes, isn't it? Good. Okay. Sole proprietors aren't taxed as a business. They're taxed, taxed at, as an individual. Okay, good. Are yeah. partners taxed as a business? Uh, no, aren't they also taxed as individuals? Correct. What about CCs? Are CCs taxed as a business? Uh, yes. Yes, good. So do you see how the different form of ownership, so if we choose to open up a company, we can't open up and register a new CC, so we'll use the company as an example. A company is also okay. a separate legal entity, so a company would have to pay its own tax as a business. Yeah. And that creates more of a consideration in terms of the finance department because if I'm running a business, I'm going to need someone in the entity that's going to have to file those tax returns. That's it. That's going to have to put all the re um, all the documents together, all the records, when when the tax uh, when the tax year is up, um, and keep that as as safekeeping in case there's an audit. Yeah. All right. Then we've got tax deductible expenses. Most important bit for, from a financial management point of view. Why do businesses like tax deductible expenses? Because who doesn't like not paying taxes? Okay, you want to pay as little as possible. So a deduction, yeah. how does a deduction benefit a company? Um, because then they can offset it against their, their tax payable. Correct. Okay, you can offset those business expenses against the taxable income. So ultimately, you yeah. receive a tax savings okay that's the biggest reason why we would want certain deductions and even allowances okay let's think about machinery uh, as a company why would a company want to continue to upgrade and purchase new equipment to keep up with the industry that they're working in okay so that's one reason in terms of operations so if i buy a new machine i'll be more productive because it might be a better model yeah. But by purchasing a new machine, I also get an added incentive because I can claim a wear and tear allowance on the depreciation of that asset. Yes. Okay. So there's there's different ways of of viewing it, and that's where the financial the, the the financial management comes into it in terms of the finance department making money decisions that actually make a difference to the company's bottom line. Yeah. Okay. And then we've got a note about withholding tax and dividends. What is a dividend? Uh, isn't that what is paid to the shareholders? Good. Okay. The, shareholders the want shares. dividends, and that's a form of tax on the payout. And then CGT is applicable when we dispose of certain assets. 
Yeah. Okay. All right, a task for you for next week. I, I want you to try source any example of a set of financial statements or an annual report. Okay. Um, public companies public annu uh, publish annual reports every year. Okay, at the end of every financial year, public companies present that information to the public and you can actually Google and find an annual report for any company that you wish to find information about. So for next yeah. week, I, I want to see what sort of example you can um, find. Okay, it could be anything. Um, public report in terms of- like um, a First. Sorry, say that again. A couple of the financial or the reports from some of the companies that have shares. In. Yes. Okay, that's perfect. They're so then, just, just use use that then as an example. Okay, and perfect. I want you to to bring that to class, and then we'll I'll I'll have an example as well, just to show um, some of the application in terms of when we actually make decisions. Okay, obviously we need to do certain calculations because those are ratios. Okay, but yeah. ratios help us with the analysis, we first need to get our hands on the actual information, which is the accounting yeah. report that we get. As a public company, it would be audited. So if it's audited, that's an extra level of um, peace of mind that those statements are reliable and accurate. Okay. Right. Yeah. So just to end off, that was the last slide there. Um, this is a summary over here. And then I want to show you two things here. Um, the first being obviously the JSE. Okay, so we spoke about primary and secondary market. The JSC is what, Nina? Primary or secondary? Primary, isn't it? Well, no, that's secondary. It's actually both. So when is the JSC primary? When they put the, the IPO on. There we go. Okay, when companies first list their shares on the JSC, we're now talking about the primary market between the financial institution, okay, generally the bank would be responsible for listing those shares, okay, and the JSC would be the platform where they would list those shares. And then if we talk okay. about the JSC as being secondary, what do we mean by that? Uh, when current owners of the shares are trading and buying between each other. Correct, okay, so this is when um, individuals, okay, are buying shares that have already been sold on the JSC. Okay, so not, yeah. not first issued, but Ish, uh, issued shares that are already on the market. Okay, on the market issues, basically. Yeah. Okay, great. And then, in terms of the JSC, the JSC is actually not that old, if you think about it. Formed in 1887. What's that, 100 and... 120, 30 years. 30 odd years, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, is it 100 or 200? It will be... Uh, 100, 130 years, yeah. 130. All right, so yeah, so not a very, very old um, exchange in terms of lifetime, but the JC has grown tremendously, obviously because of technology as well, and also growth of new companies. Because why yeah. do we want companies to grow? We want the countries to grow. So if companies yeah. do well, countries do well. So countries that have a good financial system okay more developed countries first world countries um in terms of uh, let's say the the u.s okay that's a, the u.s is still the biggest economy in the world so if we just talk about the u.s as an example their markets are very very developed and there's a lot of financial products that we can also make use of because there are so many companies in the in the u.s i mean i mean think about all the big yeah. names in the world the big names in the world are most likely american companies yeah okay so if you look at the jsc and you look at the new york stock exchange if we compare the two it's a way to also gauge um the development of or um let's say not the development the maturity of the actual system the financial system so now if we look at south africa yeah. and we compare south africa to other countries in africa um, South Africa, in terms of the JSC, would be the best place to do business because of the amount of financial products and the sophisticated systems we have in this particular place. Is that right? Uh, Anthony? Yes. Hello? Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, all right. No, you broke out there a little bit. Oh, all right, okay. All right, not too sure why, um, but anyway, um, I was just saying I that the, my side. 
there's a storm coming in and every time the lightning bolt strikes it seems to make my connection go a bit funny oh all right okay so there's a storm coming i can hear some thunder as well on my side yeah yeah <laughs> all right okay so uh, the point i was tr trying to make there is that um, in terms of the jsc the jsc is a good gauge to identify how developed um, a company's financial system is so the more companies you have on the JSC on the exchange, um, you could say that the country as a whole is doing a lot better. Because remember, yeah. companies want to generate capital, and in order to do that, they need to list on an exchange. Okay. Right, then just the, a note about the debt market. The debt market is long-term or short-term? That is long-term. Long-term. Because that's okay. bonds, isn't it? Correct, it's bonds. So the debt market, Another name would be the capital market, okay? Debt or capital market would sell debt and equity. So debt is specific to bonds, and you get different types of bonds. Government bonds, corporate bonds, the repo market, you get all types of bonds that can be bought in that particular industry. And remember, a bond, we'll learn about bonds later. We'll even look at valuing them as well in a, in a later chapter in this module. Um, but let's just think about what a bond is. If a company wants to, if a company wants to raise funds, okay, yeah. can a can a company get a lot of capital from one lender? Um, yes, but it's not ideal, isn't it? All right. Yes, it's, they it's, could, but it's more risky as well for the lender. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's easier. To it's, it's, million rand from 10 people as opposed to one person giving you a million rand. There we go, 100%. There's the answer. Okay, and that's why companies issue bonds. They issue bonds on the market because now they have access to more funders. Okay, funders, yeah. okay, people, financiers, people that are wanting to lend money will be able to do so if companies issue bonds because now it becomes more um, available in terms of being accessible by different people. Mm. Okay.